Well, thank you everybody for uh, coming to this uh, webinar. My name is David Walker. I'm the director of the Small Business Development Center uh, here in uh, Reading. Uh, we cover Shasta and uh, Trinity counties. Um, this is our, originally we, uh, uh, Linda Siniard, who's the presenter here, uh, she, uh, she'll tell you all about that. She originally created this, uh, this workshop uh, before all of the um, uh, virus uh, stuff came into play. Uh, so it's um, uh, bringing it into a webinar uh, is a little challenging, uh, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. And I appreciate you guys showing up. Uh, a little bit about the uh, SBDC, we do, uh, we provide no cost, uh, confidential, one-on-one -on -one advisory services for small businesses. We're funded by the Small Business Administration in the state of California. So we are the very definition of your tax dollars at work. Thank you for paying those taxes, by the way. Uh, we also do uh, uh, no cost uh, webinars, uh, sometimes low cost webinars uh, and uh, workshops. Right now, they're all webinars. Um, so uh, thanks for, for joining us. Uh, we're gonna try, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. There should be a microphone icon there with a line through it. If you need to unmute yourself, just click on it or uh, type your question into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there should be a little uh, chat icon and uh, feel free to type a question in there and I'll uh, field it and send it to Linda. A little bit about Linda before I uh, turn this over to her. She's had 25 years experience in human resources. And uh, well, there it is. She's got it all up there and I'll let her talk about it. Um, so yeah, Linda, why don't you take over from here? All right, thanks, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as David was saying, yes, I have uh, 25 years as an HR professional. Uh, before that, I spent nine years as a legal assistant and before that operations manager, I've been a business owner several times. Um, my national certifications in human resources, uh, the first one is from the Society for Human Resource Management. It's called a senior certified professional. And the other one is a much older certification, but much more well known. It's called senior professional in human resources. These are both uh, national <coughs> uh, certifications, but they're recognized globally. Uh, my bachelor's degree was in organizational leadership, and that was long after I had been in HR. I went back to school and to finish my degree. And uh, at the time, there were no, this is how long ago it was, <laughs> there were no human resources management degree programs. There were tons of them now. Uh, later, I went and got my master's degree in transpersonal psychology. That's the, the what I call the good psychology or the fun psychology. Um, and then currently I'm working on my PhD. I'm a, what's called a PhD candidate where I'm doing my research. So that's a bit about me. I currently work as an HR consultant, although it's very part-time right at the moment. Uh, and let's move to the next. Uh, the agenda, we will do introductions for all of you folks. And then we're gonna do the hiring section, the firing section, Q&A and a wrap up. By the end of this, uh, you should know something, at least, uh, about the requirements and best practices for hiring, firing, and then determining when or not, uh, when you need a consultant or an attorney. So, um, who would like to begin? Just tell us a little bit about you, your name, uh, your business, or your idea for a business your reason for being here today. And then if you would, please kind of add on what is the most important thing that you want to hear today? Because since the virus has uh, come around, um, people's priorities have changed and what they need to know has changed. Who would like to start? Alina Kumanish, good morning. Uh, Alina Kumanish with uh, Delhi Delicious Franchising. In the, uh, we are in the Central Valley and uh, we have uh, uh, over 50 franchises, and uh, I'm calling you on behalf of our uh, office, the Little Delicious Franchising Inc. Uh, wanted to uh, be updated on uh, what it is that uh, it is our responsibilities to the employees 
and also in terms of, um, unfortunately, with the barrage of uh, uh, downward economic pressures, when an employee is laid off, what are our responsibilities, both legally and otherwise? Thank you. Thanks, Ali. David, I can't see. Uh, yeah, any, anybody else? Online. Okay. Uh, anybody else like to uh, just, uh, if, if you have the mute button, or the, I'm sorry, the microphone button there, just click on it and it will unmute your microphone. Um, if you're having trouble, uh, send something in the chat box. Uh, you feel free to type it in the chat box there. Okay, I think I'm ready to go. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, yeah. Okay, my name is Sol Char Villegas. Um, I've been, I'm from Colombia and I moved to the States like four years ago. I've been in human resources for like 15 years. Uh, but since I don't have um, studies here in, I haven't been able to go to college here or anything in the States, I found this uh, a very interesting training for me. I am a recently, I have been recently hired um, as an HR assistant for a company here in town, which is Compass Care. And I'm excited to learn about um, hiring and um, yeah, terminations because it's part of my job now. So I am excited to be here. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, hey, anybody else? Okay, well, why don't we go from there, uh, Linda? And if anybody else uh, just you know wants to share, uh, just feel free to just uh, click the microphone and, and let us know. Okay. And also Great. feel free to ask questions along the way. Okay, so we're going to start out with hiring now. Like I said earlier, um, and for those of you who weren't online yet, uh, I developed this particular presentation uh, a few weeks ago when David and I were talking about how a lot of folks that are part of the SBDC um, are growing their businesses. So I spent a lot more time in the hiring piece and it's much more, uh, let's just say it's content rich, meaning it's a lot of words. Uh, so number one thing that and for those of you who have done this a lot, hiring and firing, your process may be very different than mine. So this is my process. This is my process also uh, having worked for over a hundred different companies as either in-house HR or as a consultant working on projects for usually for startups. <clears throat> um, first thing I do is create a job description. You have to know why you're hiring somebody. You, it helps you assess the necessity, the worth, the scope of the job. You can figure out how this job is going to combine with other jobs in, in, in your business, what it's going to free other folks up from. It clarifies for both the managers and the new hires the following. Uh, Fair Labor Standard Act status, whether the person is exempt or non-exempt. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, the essential functions of the job. These are the, the regular, you know, normal routine daily tasks that this person is responsible for. KSAs, stand, that KSA stands for knowledge, skills, and abilities. What, uh, how you would target the, the, the perfect candidate and um, how it would be aligned with the job functions. Uh, qualifications, what qualifications does the person actually need? So many job postings nowadays say college degree required. Well, there are actually very few jobs in the world where it's required to have a college degree. This has changed over the years. Uh, the positions that where it actually is required are things that are licensed. It's usually a preference, not a requirement. So that's a piece that gets kind of messed up and it's a hard one to, to set, a hard idea to sell to a lot of the leadership team, depending on the company. You should have something in the job description that talks about the physical requirements. And we always put, nowadays, we always put this uh, 
this phrase in there with or without accommodation and that's so that we're not discriminating against people with uh, physical emotional mental disabilities uh, and a bit about the work environment description this is not as important in office jobs it's very important in jobs that have a lot of manual labor and particularly manufacturing plants or hazardous uh, environments the job description supports the performance standards that you've set for the company and it also becomes the foundation of your job posting number two item when you're deciding on hiring somebody is to define the classification so exempt or non-exempt can somebody uh, just kind of if you're on mute and you know the answer unmute yourself and and, and share with us what you think exempt and non-exempt mean and if you don't feel comfortable participating i get that but but somebody take a stab at it well exempt uh, is an employee that is a salaried employee and it's not uh does not have uh, the company does not have to follow the uh the uh, hourly wage and hour rules and regulations where where hourly would be people who are going to uh have to follow all the rules and regulations of the hourly uh, uh, rules laws um, also uh, 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 there is overtime regulations regarding the uh, non-exempt uh, 40 and plus and the eight hours a day uh, it's just a few to mention thank you okay that, that was great Ali thank you um, so exempt those words exempt and non-exempt the, they came about because they mean exempt from overtime specifically. That's how it began with the Fair Labor Standards Act. And this was a very, very long time ago. I think it was in the 40s sometime. Um, so yes, it has all everything to do with how the person is paid and whether or not they have to, are required to follow wage and hour laws. Um, if you want uh, more information on that, and there's tons of information and it's one of the places companies mess up most frequently is by misclassifying people. So the Department of Labor, the Wage and Hour Division, the website is right there and you'll find tons of information. The exemptions to overtime, there are certain job classifications that fall into exempt because of the type of work and the type of responsibilities and the level of authority the person has. And those all go together. It's any one of those, if you pull it out, the person would have to go non-exempt. It's very complicated and it gets very tough to convince some business owners that the safest way always to pay a person is by the hour with overtime. There are lots of reasons for that. And I have actually been on the receiving end of the Department of Labor audits twice for larger companies, large companies that, um, that violated the, the rules on exempt and non-exempt. And one, one of the companies that actually fought with them for six years, please fix this, we have to fix this. And then somebody reported to the company for uh, uh, claiming exempt status for employees who absolutely should have been non-exempt. Um, it took six months to resolve it and it cost the company uh, quite a bit of money. So you always wanna do that part appropriately. The misclassification consequences, and by the way, these are just some of them. With the Department of Labor, you can have, they can fine you and penalize you monetarily, but they'll also, um, if they find that you, that you uh, did violate the rules, they can uh, require you to pay two years of back overtime pay to all the people in the company that were misclassified. That's the federal piece. The state of California, the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, they go back three years and also find some penalties. So it's one of the easiest things to do right. And one of the reasons that companies prefer to pay everybody exempt is because wage and hour laws are complicated and they require a lot of oversight. And overtime is expensive. That's really the crux of the matter. Um, if you, you also have to determine if you're hiring an employee or an independent contractor. The independent contractor rules have changed both federally and within the state of California over the last few years. They're much more stringent now than they ever have been. 
and um, the penalties are, are many. So the legal requirements you can find uh, at, for the feder federal government, you can find on the IRS website. <clears throat> this particular link goes to an actual publication. It's a pamphlet. And it's a nice, concise way to see how you would classify an independent contractor. And then the California uh, Assembly Bill number five, <clears throat> the best article I've seen so far is on NOLO Press um, website. NOLO Press is a legal publishing company. They have lots of great uh, books for businesses. Also, well, just tons of books about all kinds of legal things. But if you go to NOLO.com, and just put in California AB5, you'll find um, all the recent information that this particular AB5 just started January 1st of this year. So it's slightly different than the 2018 rule, which was the ABC rule, <clears throat> which meant that your independent contractors had to fall into three categories, not just two, because then they'd be an employee and you'd have to put them on payroll. Uh, the requirements also, you have to have a W9. This is the form that is the tax classification for the federal government. And then at the end of the year, you don't send um, a W-2 to this person, you send a 1099. So they are treated differently as far as taxes are concerned. Misclassification risks and some of the penalties. If you misclassify a person as an independent contractor when they actually should have been an employee, you can be liable for violating tax laws pension and retirement plans, workers' comp laws, and unemployment insurance laws. You also can be uh, dinged for violating the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, laws, <clears throat> um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Age Discrimination in Employment Act, and the Fair Labor Standards Act. You also would be liable for, um, for denying leave of absences that are protected leaves for employees but which would not come into play for a true independent contractor also reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities and then of course wage and hour laws if let's suppose you uh, did misclassify someone and they made a claim to the department of labor and the department of fair employment and housing they could come after you for overtime even though you thought they were a contractor and you had a signed contract with them if they do not technically, you know, line by line qualify, the numbers that these lawsuits go into are ridiculously high. So just be very careful that you know what you're hiring, independent contractor or an employee. Any questions? Um, federal and state taxes. When you hire a new employee, you must have an employer identification number from the IRS. The form is called an SS4. And that's how you apply for the EIN or FEIN, depending on where you live and how you, how you choose to use acronyms. Um, <clears throat> uh, the IRS website, just put in form SS4 and apply for your employer identi identification number. In the state of California, you have to establish a payroll tax account with the Employment Development Department. That's the website. And just go in there and do a search for California payroll tax account for employer. These, both of these processes take a while, so uh, do it early before you hire your first employee. Workers' compensation is required in California. Um, it's required in, in most states, and believe it or not, not all. Um, it covers workplace injuries and illnesses, and that's not I got ill and therefore I didn't go to work. It's you got ill because of work. Um, it, back in the old days, if you had a stress claim, it said, oh, at least 50% of my stress comes from work, you could actually file a work, workers' comp claim for that. A few years ago, that changed because stress in the workplace uh, is so rampant nowadays, and it went up to 80%. You have to be able to prove that 80% of your stress comes from work. Other illnesses could be things like... Um, you were exposed to a chemical or a particular paint that caused respiratory problems. So then in workplace injuries are just self-explanatory. If the claim is approved, uh, it covers time off of work for the employee. They get paid by workers' compensation and not the company for the time they are, they are off. It's, it's a fraction of what their normal salary is though. 
their medical bills are covered and their prescriptions are covered. One thing that a lot of folks don't know is that mileage reimbursement to and from their medical appointments is also covered. And if they are not able to drive, uh, then it'll pay for taxi or Uber. Some employees are gonna hire attorneys no matter what. So the workers' compensation process uh, and the mandate is actually uh, a really well working process. It works, but some employees for, for whatever reason, and there's a variety of reasons, sometimes they just aren't familiar enough with how it works and they may not have anybody at the job who's able to explain it well enough. So they feel like they need an attorney. When an attorney gets involved, you can bet that the final settlement, which often there is a payout at the end of one of these claims, if the person is not able to come back to work with no modifications to their uh, return to work program, meaning they don't have any physical limitations. If there is a loss of mobility at all, something that got hurt that can't recover completely, workers' comp does actually pay them out a settlement at the end. And when an attorney gets involved, the, those numbers go up. Uh, you, you must put a payroll system in place in order to hire your first person. Manual processing, I'm dropping to the bottom there. Manual processing is legal, but it's not really advised anymore. The laws are complicated. The numbers of uh, federal and state payroll taxes that come out of everyone's checks are many, many more than they used to be. And then when you add in benefit deductions, it gets very complicated. It's really easy to mess it up. I speak from experience. I have messed it up. So I haven't worked with a manual processing uh, uh, payroll system probably for well over 20 years now. But when I first got into to HR, we did use manual processing. And it was just basically uh, you know, doing the calculations for each and every paycheck. So to going back up to the top there, an automated payroll system is the preferred way nowadays. It'll calculate the employee employee and employer taxes, both state and federal. And then <clears throat> that's if you have an automated payroll system within your own company. In other words, you have purchased the software. If you don't want to do your own payroll processing, nowadays there are just tons and tons of outsourced payroll vendors. They're usually actually less expensive for small business owners than buying an automated payroll system. So check those out. <clears throat> You'll hear them on the radio all the time, by the way. Um, Patriot is one, Bamboo, or no, not Bamboo, Gusto is another one for small businesses. If you need more information on that in the future, just let me know. Then you post an open position. Once you have those, those structural things in place, you need to post your open position. So the job posting is what we call a sell sheet to attract candidates to your company and the position. You're, this is where you're trying to bring them in, draw them in, tell them how great the company is and how great the job is. Um, you use your job description as the basis for the, for the posting. Please don't ever post your job description. A job description is a legal document. It has a lot of details in it that really aren't going to do anything to encourage people to come work for you. Like the, sometimes, uh, and I see them all the time, companies do it all the time, it's a, it's a shortcut. So I get that, you're strapped, you need time for other projects, so you just post the job description. But it doesn't, it doesn't have the same impact, the same attraction impact that a job posting does. Um, so consider that when you get ready to post cut out you know, the most um, enticing parts of the job description. And you might wanna leave that part, like the work environment or the physical requirements, unless it's manual labor, um, out of it. Uh, best places to find employees, employee referrals. It is actually the number one uh, best proven, actually, way to find employees. And the reason is if a current employee refer someone, you've got to bet that they are only going to refer somebody who they really believe would do well in the job. Because if they don't, it's going to reflect poorly on them. There are some companies who won't do employee referrals. And then there are others that are actually paying up to $10,000 per referral to the referring or to the employee who's referring the candidate. Uh, Trimble Inc. They have a, a plant here in town. Um, 
they're actually paying up to $10,000 for re referrals right now. It's pretty astronomical. Um, online job boards, these are just a handful. Indeed, ZipRecruiter and LinkedIn. If you haven't used LinkedIn, beware. It's very expensive to post there. Uh, ZipRecruiter, I think they have a free posting uh, component. I'm not exactly sure. I've never used ZipRecruiter, although they're very popular. I've used Indeed a lot over the years since they've been in business. Um, very moderate pricing. Association job boards. So if you belong to, like Ali, you, you may belong to uh, the National Restaurant Association. I don't know if you do, but that's yeah. also a place that sometimes um, your whatever industry you're in, if you have an association, chances are they have a job posting uh, component to the web, to their website. Um, it's also, like I said, it's it's that thing of um, finding the people targeting your your candidate pool uh, to find the people who either are in your industry or in the actual job description. Uh, Craigslist for years, everyone used Craigslist when they first came out. As a matter of fact, Craigslist pretty much put uh, classified ads out of business in the newspaper industry. And um, one of the reasons was it was free everywhere except in San Francisco in the beginning. So when they first started out, um, the only place where you had to pay for an ad was in the city of San Francisco. Now that they've branched out so much, and become actually kind of diluted in terms of targeting uh, employed candidates. Um, it's, still, it, it's still good though. It still draws a lot of folks. And then your network, whatever your network is. If you're in LinkedIn, post to post in, you, you know, do it in your feed. Don't, don't pay for the posting if you don't have that kind of money. Put an, put an announcement in your feed about uh, uh, your new job posting. Put a link to wherever it can be seen, if it's on your company website or on some other um, job board like Indeed or ZipRecruiter. Next thing that happens is the application and interviews. So an application is also a legal document. It can be used for the best of things and the worst of things. <laughs> um, California has statewide requirements for applications and some of our cities have additional requirements. So things have changed dramatically in the past, I'm gonna say 10 years in the state of California. We have more employment laws in this state than anywhere else in the country. And we are very um, employee friendly in terms of our uh, employment laws. Massachusetts and New York also are. I've worked in both of those uh, states as well. And the, the similarities are pretty close now between those three. Um, so you'll always want to check, make sure in Reading in Shasta County, this is a piece of cake. You just follow the statewide requirements. If you are hiring somebody as a remote employee and they live in San Francisco or Berkeley or parts of Santa Clara County and a lot of parts of Los Angeles County, you will need to check on those municipalities' um, requirements for applications. All applicants attest to the information being accurate and that's one of the most important pieces about the application. They sign, either ink sign or electronically sign, that everything they've said in the application is correct. It, this is where the, it, it being a legal document has a lot of validity because if later on you find out that they lied on the application, you can say, but you said it was accurate and that it, you know, we found out it's not. And that is actually a cause for termination. Remember that a resume is a narrative. It's not a legal document. So a lot of times companies hire just off of a resume and don't require the application. And this is where you have nothing to fall back on if you find out that large portions or even some portions, but very important portions of the resume were just fictitious. Um, if the person is hired, you keep the application in the employee file. If they're not hired or the applications that come in that you don't even bother interviewing, you want to keep those applications for two years. There is no law to keep them at all. You can throw them right in the trash, but don't do it. And here's why. If you uh, have talked to somebody 
or on the phone, did a phone pre-screening, or you did a video conference, or you called them in and had a face-to-face -face interview, or several, and you don't hire that person, and then, let's say, down the road, the candidate comes back and says, hey, I'm just checking in, I never heard back, did you fill the position? You say, oh, yes, we did, I'm so sorry, I haven't gotten my, you know, my letters out yet, and they say, oh, well, who'd you hire? Oh, well, I'm, you know, we're not allowed to, to, to give that information, but pretend they know somebody at the company and they find out the person you hired is, mm, let's say, 35, and the person you didn't hire is, let's say, mm, 55, they can actually file a claim for age discrimination. So what you want to do is keep all those applications and resumes and files that are uh, according to the job title for at least two years. Most people will not wait two years to file a claim. So you want to keep it for two years so you can prove by the resume and the application that there, it was not discrimination. It was actually the person did not qualify as well as the person you hired. Any questions on that? Interviews. I did not go into the, all of the do's and don'ts about interviews because that's a whole training in and of itself. Um, but there are so many different types. As I just mentioned, you can have phone interviews, video interviews, which are more and more popular over the years. But right now, it's pretty much the only way companies are, hire, are uh, interviewing anybody. I've been looking at the job ads lately just to see since the virus came around what's changed. And a lot of them are saying video interviews available immediately. Um, In-person interviews, that's one of the ones we're most uh, familiar with. Then there's the types of interviews, structured, behavior-based, situational, panel, stress, and then serial. Example about serial, Google, and I believe they're still doing this, it's been a while since I checked, but Google requires no less than six interviews. It's ridiculous, but at the same time, they are very, very uh, cultured. Their corporate culture is so strong that if they don't believe from the viewpoint of many, many people having interviewed their candidates that you are a quote unquote fit for the Google culture, and this is far beyond your job skills, um, they want to hear that from as many people as you're going to interact with. It's an incredibly time consuming thing. It's really expensive and it's done in a lot of technology companies. It's done in a lot of companies just where that thing, the culture of the company is almost stronger than your qualifications. You also want to be careful that title seven of the civil rights act that you avoid discrimination in your hiring process. And this starts with your application review and your interviews. Don't ask any questions that have to do with the candidate's race, their sex, color, national origin, or religion. Those are the, those are the things covered under Title VII. However, over time, many, many more uh, um, uh, laws have come into play that also address discrimination. So the ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADEA, the Age Discrimination in Employment Act, GINA, and I always mess this one up and I'm probably going to mess it up today. It's the genetic information, and I never remember what the N is. Does somebody know? Gen uh, genetic information, mm, maybe it's, I think it's Non-Discrimination Act. Okay, well, I'll have to look that one up. And then recently, Ban the Box. Ban the box is uh, back, back before, hmm, I think it was in California, I think it might have been two or three years ago, we, were, we had to take the box that says, have you ever been convicted of a criminal um, offense? It used to be on all of our applications. That is not allowed in California and several other states now. You can't ask that. The only time you can ask about their criminal history is after you have made a conditional offer of employment. Ban the box is for any of you who have five or more employees. If you have less than five employees, you can still put that box on your uh, application. And you can still ask in interviews. You can no longer in the state of California ask about salary history. And then for some folks, that's just, it just doesn't make sense at all. I will tell you from an HR perspective, it makes all the sense in the world. And here's why. 
lots of hiring managers and lots of executive teams have gone, have paid people according to what the person made at their last company and the company before and the company before. And they only offer them a little bit more than their uh, ending wage at the last organization. What this caused was huge pay disparities within uh, working groups and within companies. So as we all know, uh, women still make less in the workplace than men and um, people of color also make less than uh, white people. And it's wrong. At the same time, there are companies that still rely on well, what did you make before? So since it's illegal in the state of California now to ask that information, what it has done is it, it, it forces companies to do the right thing from the beginning assess the value to the company of the job and pay accordingly. Also don't ask anything about sexual orientation or sexual identity. If you don't know the difference, sexual orientation is the sex that was assigned to you at birth. Sexual identity is how you identify as to your gender or no gender uh, currently. So stay away from all of those. And like I said, there are tons of do's and don'ts and a lot of information about the different types of interviews, whether they're structured, behavior-based, situational panel, or stress. And, um, but it's a whole different training. So, um, okay. Next thing is an offer of employment. Sometimes this is just a phone call, depending on the type of job. You offer them the job, they come in, they start working, they do their paperwork and they start working. You're always better off to have an offer letter even if it's if if it's uh, a, a a lower paid um, even a minimum wage an hourly job that's minimum wage it's better to have something but if you don't go to the the formality of an offer letter I'll show you at the end of this screen what's what's out there that's uh, required actually so your offer letter has the job title who they're reporting to the start date whether they're exempt or non-exempt full full time or part time whether they're temporary or seasonal and please don't ever use the word permanent this is a permanent position there's no such thing as a permanent position um, and we used to call them temporary or permanent employees we dropped that years ago because it's 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 like saying i promise you you'll be permanent and then you fire them later and not so permanent so that's where legal claims come up you state the annual salary for exempt employees, the salaried employees, and you state the hourly wage for non-exempt employees, but you also include what it would be on an annual basis, and that changed a few years ago as well. You also must put the overtime rate in there. Uh, put information about the paydays, whether they're on the, you know, the, the 15th and the last day of the month or whatever your pay cycle is, and then a summary of the benefits. In an offer letter, you don't give them the whole benefit package. You just put in a summary. And then of course, in 47 of our 50 states, we have what's called the at-will clause. I'll show you that in a minute. And then if you're not doing an offer letter, uh, but you, and you're doing hourly employees, you're hiring an hourly employees, there is a, a form called the 2810.5. And just that, put that into uh, your search bar, look it up online, you'll come up with it right away. You can either use it with the offer letter or exclusively, no offer letter. It has everything I just mentioned above in the form. And it's required in California to give this to non-exempt employees unless you have stated all of the same information. And it has more information. It has information about who your um, workers' comp carrier is. That's the reason that it goes to the employee immediately on offer. New hire forms. Uh, you're probably all familiar with these, maybe not. W-4 form, that's the federal tax withholding form that the employee fills out to tell you how many exemptions they want to have in their uh, payroll withholdings. Uh, this form goes to the employer, it does not go to the IRS. It's a federal form, but it does not get sent anywhere. It stays either in the accounting department or in the employee's um, personnel file. The DE-4 is a California tax withholding form. It's the same thing as a W-4, but it's just for California. 
if you only hire people in California, you're unlikely to use the DE4. If you hire people uh, for different locations or if you have remote employees, let's say a marketing person that works in Oklahoma for your company and they're your employee, not an independent contractor, then you want them to fill out their own state tax withholding form. And in those cases, if you have employees in more than one state, you will want your California employees to fill out the DE-4. Um, the DE-35 is notice to employee. Um, this is just a requirement by the um, Employment Development Department. The I-9 is a federal form that's put out by the United States Customs and Immigration Service. This is the Employment Eligibility Verification Form. It says that you are authorized to work in the United States. Either you are a citizen or you have um, a green card or you have a visa or some other documentation that says you are eligible to work in the United States. Don't keep these in your employee files. And there are tons of reasons. That's a whole training in itself too. Um, the uh, if you are a larger company, and I'm guessing we're all small companies here. If you're a larger company, you may want to do what's called E-Verify. It's an online program where it covers the same information as the I-9, and it gives you immediate verification that the person is authorized to work in the United in the United States. You actually uh, scan in their whatever documentation they have given you as proof of their authorization. It's typically that the most frequent documents are a driver's license or California ID card and a social security card, but you can also use a passport. There are tons of, of documents you can use and the I-9 form has them all listed. So once you've collected those documents, if you put them in the E-Verify system, it notifies you immediately if the per person is authorized. If you do a paper I-9 form, you have no verification that the person is authorized other than the documents they presented to you and therefore you as the hiring person sign attesting to the fact that you have examined their documents and you believe that they're genuinely uh, that they're genuine documents they're not copies they're the real documents the i-9 form stays with you it doesn't go to the uscis and like i said it keep it in a separate employee file i'll just give you the tip top of that iceberg um, the reason you keep it in a separate file is because if ICE or any other uh, um, component of the USCIS comes to your workplace and requests documentation on your employees as to their eligibility to work in the United States, you don't want to hand them an employee file because that has everything about that employee in it. It's got all kinds of confidential information uh, that is not included on a 99, and you don't want to give away information about a, a an, in, about an employee when it doesn't relate to why the USCIS or ICE is there in the first place. So just keep those in a separate binder. It's all I nine forms. Uh, any company specific forms that you have. Sometimes it's a non disclosure agreement. Sometimes it's a confidentiality agreement. It might be a security controls agreement. Uh, some companies, I've worked with some that they have so many company specific forms and agreements that you have to fill out. It takes half a day just for the employee to read them and, and fill them out. Um, and then benefits enrollment forms. If you are offering benefits and if you are offering them from day one, this is something you would offer to that employee that day. Uh, now most companies are going to online enrollments for benefits, but you would want to walk the employee through that. If you have a delayed uh, participation for benefits, then you don't need to include that on day one, but you would want to include information about whatever benefits you have. And then those are the new hire uh, forms for the employee. Then the employer is required in California to fill out a DE-34, which is the report of new employees. It goes to the Employment Development Department and there is an online e-business site for employ employers. You don't have to fill out the paper form. Lots of companies still fill out the paper form and just mail it in and that's fine. Um, what it is, it's uh, this came about a few years ago, quite a few years ago now, 
it is the form that notifies um, the what it, whatever department it is in your state. I'm sorry, I'm used to working with um, multiple states. Um, California that has to do with child support services. So if there's a parent who's working for you, new employee, they're back in child support, haven't paid for maybe several years even, when that report of new employee goes to the EDD, the EDD shares that information with the, um, what is it called? DCS, Department of Child Services, I can't remember now. Um, that's a whole different area. Um, but they share the information so that the child support department in your county can start collecting from that new employee through wage garnishments. So you're required to fill that out. Any questions? Um, also in California, we're required to give out four, there's tons more, but these are required pamphlets to new employees. You can print these online. You don't have to pay for them. Um, some of the insurance brokers will give them to you for free if you have a, a large employee population. But for a small employer, just print these off, off the internet. Disability insurance provisions, there's the form number. The paid family leave insurance information, there's the form number. Time to hire, the, the two at the top are from the um, Employment Development Department, but if you just put in those words, you'll find them. Time to Hire is from Department of Industrial Relations. Um, it's required, and then a, uh, from the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, a pamphlet on sexual harassment. These are required notices. So in every workplace, you must have federal and state labor law posters posted somewhere, usually in a break room, lunch room, main hallways, anywhere that people, uh, your employees frequently pass by and can stop and read. It's really um, important to have these up for so many reasons. Number one, it's required, but it also relieves you of having to repeat constantly the same laws that are in place uh, because an employee can just go stand and look at the federal and state labor law posters. We're really lucky nowadays you can get these in one poster, both the federal laws and the state labor laws. The uh, Cal California Chamber has uh, has these for purchase. I think they're I think they're less than thirty dollars. It includes the federal and state labor laws in one poster. Employee handbook, safety programs, and IIPP. Employee handbook is not required by law. However, it is a best practice and should be updated annually. One of the biggest mistakes my clients have made over the years is having an employee handbook that is outdated and does not include laws that change in, in California. In California, our employment laws frequently change with effective dates of either January 1st or July 1st. And because we have so many of them, it's important to keep your handbook updated. If you don't, it's one of the things that the employee can use when they say, oh, Mr. Attorney, I um, was just let go of my job and this is the employee handbook and here's the thing that they said in this handbook, not knowing that the law had changed. Um, California, California Chamber, again, has an excellent product that you can purchase uh, for employee handbooks and it is totally modifiable in the areas that are um, recommended. So you can put in all of your own information, you can put in a lot of additional information, and then it'll have static uh, text in the template that you can't change because they're actual laws. A safety program is not required by law except in certain industries. So these would be um, hazardous uh, industries or construction, um, electricians, there are a lot of them. Manufacturing where certain chemicals are used, then your safety program is required and you can look those up at uh, OSHA.gov. Um, also, don't forget that because we live in California, we have what's called Cal OSHA. So California has a few extra rules, but if you start with OSHA.gov, they have templates there where you can create your own safety programs. 
And then an IIPP is an illness and injury prevention program. And it is the document that says uh, how you're going to handle safety and illnesses and injuries and what kinds of preventive measures are in place for your organization. These are required when you have 10 or more employees. It's a good idea to do one regardless, even if you have one employee, just know how you would handle this if somebody got hurt at work or somebody got sick at work and what safety measures are in place. Like, do you have, you know, frayed cords that are stringing together your equipment, whatever equipment that is that they're using. So those things, like I said, not required for the employee handbook, not required by law, but definitely a best practice. Safety program, not required except in certain industries and IIPP if you have 10 or more employees. Number 12, employee files. Everybody does these differently. There are some real basic things about them though. Keep a separate file for each employee. When I've worked for companies that have 10 or less employees, sometimes literally, <laughs> one, one company I worked for, um, literally just threw all the new hire documents in a drawer. And it, it was just impossible to, 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 train, <laughs> to train the owner of this company. that This is actually confidential information. They're also actually supposed to be in locked cabinets. Um, so keep a separate file for each employee because they are confidential. This has their social security number in it. It's got their emergency contact. It's got their home address. You don't want anybody, just anybody to look at that information. You also have to get in California, not every state, but you have to give the employee the right to review the employee handbook or excuse me, employee file, their own, own employee file, and they can request copies. There's, there are rules about how long you can take to give them the copies and you can look those up online. Keep medical records in a separate file. And you might ask yourself, why would I have medical records on my employee since that's all protected by HIPAA? Well, if your employee gets hurt at work, you might get documents where the um, reporting physician's office may have put some kind of diagnosis on the document, which you weren't supposed to see, but they messed up. And there it is. It just came in the mail or in your fax or in an email. And so you want to keep medical records that have anything to do with your employee, whether they have um, voluntarily given it to you, or if it's workers comp related, keep those in separate files. Um, and then, like I said earlier, keep your I-9 forms in a separate file. Uh, why would an employee voluntarily give you medical records? There are a few instances. If you have an employee with a medical condition where they may need assistance, and they take medication at work, or they have some type of assistive device, devices, or if they have requested reasonable accommodation for a disability, they will hand you all kinds of, of uh, health information that's protected by law. But they want you to know, this is going on with me, and I might need your help at some point in time. So here's my information. <clears throat> Number 13. For new hires, if you are fortunate enough to be large enough to offer benefits to your employees, um, then you want to maintain current documentation. Benefits programs change every single year, which is why we only offer benefits either at the time of hire or at what we call open enrollment, which is after your company, either HR or you personally, have worked with an insurance broker or with a 401k uh, broker or with a pension broker or all of the above to figure out what your contract is going to look like for the new year. So that's, remember, that's the only at the time of hire or during open enrollment each year. And open enrollment can happen at any time of year according to your company preference. The majority of this country has open enrollment if you're on a fiscal year of January 1 to December 31, it's almost always in October or November before the end of the year so that it can be effective on, the new benefits can be effective on January 1st. Other companies have a different fiscal year and they will adjust their open enrollment accordingly. Not a regular part of benefits packages, but something everybody should know. California paid sick leave is administered differently in some cities throughout California. There's the state mandate, but it's always paid by the employer. So this isn't something that, this is not the California uh, paid, California 
paid family leave, which is a tax that we pay in through our payroll taxes, and then we get some money back, similar to disability or unemployment, when we go out on a paid family leave. This is California paid sick leave. Uh, before it came into play, we were not required by law to pay employees when they were off work because they were sick. Now we are. And so are several other states now, thank goodness. And right now, it's incredibly important with the virus. And again, not every state has it. So I know I ran through that quickly, but who has questions? No questions? Is anybody left? David, is anybody here? <laughs> yeah, there's people here. Okay, I, I, sorry guys, I can't see who's online. <laughs> Thank um, you. You've been quite uh, thorough with the information. We appreciate it. Well, good. Thank you for the feedback. And we're going to move into the firing part of the program. Um, okay. I don't like the word firing. I've never liked the word firing. It sounds harsh. It sounds somehow just, it's just negative. It's a negative way. I call it termination, which my now adult children, but my kids always thought was worse than firing. Um, and also the, the technical, the California uh, uh, Employment Development Part Department calls it discharge. So no matter what you call it, it's when the employment relationship ends. These are the most common uh, ways uh, employment can end by layoff, reduction in force, business closure, termination for cause, also known as discharge, or the at-will clause. I'll explain more about that. Not a termination are reduced work hours and furloughs. These started happening at the beginning of this virus before people were laid off completely. Uh, companies were reducing hours because of reduction in um, sales or business. And furloughs are when you uh, have, it's a, a, actually it's a fairly complicated process that also you work with the employment development department to design your furlough program where you're cutting hours, but you're cutting hours for, like, for whole departments. This happens more often in things like um, manufacturing, light industrial, than it does in some other segments of the population and some of their industries. But if you reduce an employee's work hours or put them on furlough, they are often eligible for unemployment claims for partial work loss. So know that, especially if you're reducing anybody's hours right now. Um, a layoff. It's generally a situation in which there's low productivity, a change in the business, an economic decline like we're having right now. Um, post merger and acquisition, when you buy another company or you merge with another company, you have lots of duplicated positions and you start laying people off. Um, or other mitigating circumstances. That's very broad and that, that's, it's a reason, the reason it's broad is because none of us saw this virus coming. And so, yes, it's a mitigating circumstance. But I wasn't specific about it because this just reminds me that I don't know what's gonna happen in the future and other things could come up that would cause companies to have to lay people off. Your layoffs can be temporary or permanent. If you're laying off a whole division, which would be known as a reduction in force, we'll go into that in a minute, but it is still a layoff. Um, they're not coming back you're not going to offer them their job back because their division went away. Some people may have transferable skills and could actually work in another area, but you lay them off, they go file an unemployment claim. If they want to apply in a different position and they were, you know, employees that you were um, very happy with their job forms, you would, of course, take their application and see if they, you could hire them. Um, and temporary is more for companies that have uh, businesses that are seasonal. So high production in the summer and low production in the winter, you may lay people off in the winter, but you're gonna hire those same people back. If they were, you know, like I said, good employees, good productivity, had no performance issues, and you hire them back when things get busy again. The employee is not at fault, and they're typically eligible for unemployment insurance. 
In this section on firing, you'll, you'll notice I use the words generally and typically a lot. And here's the reason. The employer doesn't make the decision about whether a terminated employee is eligible for unemployment insurance. The EDD makes that decision. We have a component of it as the employer where we, you know, do where the EDD calls us and we do an interview and they ask us questions as to why the person was terminated. If we say, oh, it was a layoff, we had a change in business direction, or it was a layoff, the virus, whatever your reason is, then the EDD makes the determination. But pretend the employee didn't qualify because they had uh, taken unemployment money while they had their last job. So they took unemployment money, but the, their benefits, they continued taking those checks even after they started working, then they owe the EDD department. They have to reimburse them for taking an overpayment. So they get laid off from your company, they go apply, they file a claim, and the EDD looks that up, and they go, oh, that person owes us money, they're not getting money right now. <clears throat> So generally and typically is used a lot in this section. A reduction in force, otherwise known as a RIF. This is an organizational change. It's usually a, a bunch of people are leaving the company at the same time. I've closed down so many uh, manufacturing plants and uh, through selling what's called divestiture, sold off large portions of Boeing. This was years ago, but um, I've worked on RIF teams for and and layoffs and terminations for well over 12,000 people. It's it's awful, but it happens. Um, this can be an economic decline either within the company, um, market based or an industry industry based change or a geographical change. Let's pretend for a moment your co particular community is hit hard by an economic change. Take the car fire and the campfire where jobs just didn't exist because things burned down. I mean, if you look at Paradise, one of my clients, um, 14, they, they had 14 locations and 10 of them burned down. So they had to riff out 35 people out of the organization. They didn't have jobs for them. There was no place to go. And they lost all of those uh, people who were their customers. So um, there are, they're, they're considered layoffs, but a RIF, where you're taking away a lot of people at the same time, you're required to keep demographic information on them. Did these people belong to certain protected classes? And a protected class is just a legal term that means there's a law that says somebody of your particular description is protected in certain ways. We'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. There's also a provision called the Warren provision. It's the Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act, which says if you're laying off more than a particular percentage, I believe it's 15%, I haven't done one of these in a long time, um, you have to give at least 60 days notice to anybody that's going to be laid off. Or you have to pay them out for that 60 days if you're gonna terminate them earlier. It's a very, very uh, mm, complicated process that will probably, unless you have Mm, let's say hundreds or thousands of employees won't be of concern. Just know it's out there. Business closures, obviously, if the business is closing, everyone's getting uh, terminated. You could call this a layoff, but a layoff sometimes presumes that they're coming back when things change. Well, they're not coming back with a business closure. So it would normally, there's a box you can check that says it's a discharge business closure. Termination for cause. This is the hard, this, this is where the hard stuff uh, ends up. This means that the employee has willfully and sometimes even unknowingly violated a company policy or they've broken the law at work. Um, I've fired people for stealing at work. I've fired people for selling pot at work when it was illegal. I don't know what I would do right now, but hmm, I guess I would still, I don't know. Um, uh, and in some cases outside of work, they can break the law outside of work and it will have something to do with an application about the type of work they do. Here's an example. Let's pretend you work in um, a post-acute care uh, facility 
and you have people who are in medical care, long-term care, and one of your employees is uh, arrested and convicted, very different, arrested and convicted for elder abuse. Well, you don't want them to come back to work for you because they might do something similar inside the, the job. There are all kinds of laws that you have to deal with if you terminate somebody's em employment because of a conviction and it has something to do with your employee population or your customer or client or consumer popula population. Uh, not meeting performance standards, this is the most frequent. The person's just not cutting it. They just can't do the job. They only make 10 widgets when everybody else on that particular production line is making 82. So not meeting performance standards. And then a slew of other behaviors or actions that are not in the best interest of the company or the managers or coworkers. One of them is um, violent or disruptive behavior. You wanna get those people out of there. They're causing problems and they have the potential to be dangerous. Yes, I've let a few of those folks go too. And it's a scary process, but it's necessary. So termination for cause. And like I said, when I say a slew of other behaviors or actions, so many random things have come up in the time I've been doing this. I can't even tell you most, I mean, the stories are just sometimes so outrageous. Um, and some of my former employees are in jail for things that they have done either at work. One of, <laughs> one of my former employees is in jail for 60 years because of something he did at work. So, um, you know, these things come up and you got to deal with it. At will termination. We, have over the years since we have had at will and like i said it's in 47 u.s states now it was a, originally it was just i think it was just california and new york i'm not sure i can't remember anymore but um we think oh that's the easy out something's not working but we don't we don't really want to talk to this person about it or they're just they're just obnoxious i just don't like this person we think oh we can use the at will termination clause mm, not really yes and no and it depends on your sense of comfort with risk. If you have a high comfort level with risk, you may say, at will clause, they're out of here. Linda, get them out of here. And I have been told this numerous times by, by my bosses. Um, and I, you know, I always have to go back and say, okay, but there are these things to consider. Some of the things, well, I'll go into that in a minute. Um, but there can be long-term ramifications, legal fees, court costs, stuff that is just you wouldn't imagine comes up when you terminate on the at-will clause and you don't have a real good, solid case for terminating. The sample language that sh should be in your offer letter and in your employee handbook is company ABC is an at-will employer. Either the company or the employee may end the employment relationship at any time for any reason with or without notice. And if you have uh, people who haven't been in the working population for a long time, the first time they see this, they'll sometimes say, well, what do you mean? You could just fire me at any minute? And the answer is technically, yes. We don't choose to just fire people at, you know, for no reason at all, but it is true. We are protected, but so are you. You don't have to give us notice. We would prefer it if you would give us two weeks notice when you decide to leave the company but it's not required. So that's a bit about at will. Just know that if you choose to pull this one out of your hat and say, oh, I just don't, I don't like that person. I'm just gonna use the at will clause. It can come back to bite you. Number seven in this uh, firing section, in real estate, we often hear location, location, location. In human resources, we literally preach documentation, documentation, documentation. And we preach it because our leadership teams and our managers sometimes just don't, they say, I don't have time to document. I've talked to that person six times, but I don't have time to write all that down. Well, guess what? If you don't have time to write all that down, but your employee has written it down every time you've talked to them, their notes win. Their notes win. So in some time, it can be as simple as they keep a calendar and you don't. And on their calendar, they note down all these things that you've said. And you may have said unnice or even terrible things to that employee. You may have yelled at that employee. You may have had bad behavior yourself. If you are not a person who is prone to documentation and have not been trained to do that, get in the habit of it. Like now, 
<laughs> because a, a lot of employees keep a lot of notes nowadays. There's so much information about how to protect yourself on the job. They have it just as readily as we do. You can search anything. Uh, the costs associated with legal disputes are astronomical. And I know this because I have written those checks from companies to uh, former employees when they have won the case. And seriously, one of them was literally a calendar. That's why I use that as an example. They're not infrequent claims. And the hardest part for some of my former bosses to have, to have dealt with is the fact that they pay their attorneys more in fees than they do in the final settlements to the former employees. Pretend for a moment the employee says, oh, it's discrimination based on X, Y, Z. And you get down the road and you say, okay, you know, she's written a demand letter from her attorney, wrote a demand letter. And if we don't settle with her and pay her a year of her salary, she's going to sue us. And they fight it out for a while. And sometimes I saw one go on for two and a half years. In that two and a half years, the company paid out something like a half million dollars in legal fees. And the guy who had filed the original demand letter, you know, based on, I'm going to sue you if you don't. Um, all he asked for was a year of his salary, which and he was a very, very high paid uh, chief operating officer. But they paid out almost twice as much in attorney fees. Number eight is documentation again. So document, assess performance standards that are outlined in your employee handbook. Make sure that you've put in your job descriptions what you expect out of this person's job and therefore them once they're hired. Uh, refer to the job description, update them regularly. Jobs change all the time. Make sure your job descriptions actually reflect what the people are doing. It doesn't have to be every day, but there's a major change in your department or the expectations out of a particular, particular role. Add it or delete it, edit it, change it, whatever, in the job description as well and give the employee a new copy. Um, establish a performance management process, also called performance reviews, performance evaluations, um, there's so many names nowadays to this. That's why I call it performance management. Pick a process and use it <laughs> and document it. Um, also deliver difficult conversations about poor performance directly with your employee. It does you no good to complain to another manager or your boss or a coworker of theirs when you've never actually told the employee. It's not fair to them. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to coworkers. And um, if once you go into it, you need to actually know how you would support the employee who's underperforming or performing poorly. Um, how would you support them improving? What are you going to do to help? Document it. Any interactions with employees that are related to performance, do it consistently. Number nine is uh, documentation. Again, it's only as good as the content, though. These are. <laughs> These are actual things that I've read in people's documentation. Um, so pay attention to and eliminate any language that can be interpreted as discriminatory or retaliatory. These are actual. She failed to meet her sales goals because she went out on parental leave. That's a fail. Parental leave is protected by law. She doesn't align with our company culture and it appears to be generational. That's a fail. Age, if you're over 40, you are protected by the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. It's unclear why he wants to relocate. And at his age, it's a fail. Again, the ADEA. Ever since he married that woman from Asia, he seems distracted. It's a fail. You're combining things with his marital status and where his wife is from and saying that that has something to do with distractedness at work. Those two things are not directly related to job performance. Maybe they, he said something that, that made this manager phrase it that way. I don't remember, but this was actually documented. It, again, it's a type of discrimination. This one's really rough because this is not protected by law. It's protected by just basic human integrity. His productivity has fallen off since his daughter died. I was floored. And yep, 
that's what I got. That, by the way, was not from his manager. The owner of the company said that. Um, okay, number 10, these are protected classes I mentioned earlier. Before you make a final decision about termination, consider if the employee may be part of one or more of these protected classes, their gender, age, race, disability, religion, national origin, their sexual um, orientation and or identity, LGBTQIA+, in case you didn't know there were that many letters, I'd be happy to explain them, um, and native language. And by the way, there are more. And in certain cities or municipalities, there are more than this. These are the ones that we're most familiar with. Sometimes you're gonna have somebody who's, uh, let's see, let's take female over 40 with a disability. That person's protected by laws in three categories of protected classes. And if you get ready to terminate that person, you better have solid, solid documentation of a, a, a rock solid reason for terminating. And if you talk to an attorney about it, sometimes they'll say, I don't care how solid it is. Don't do it. This person's going to come get you. And they will. Uh, next one, protected leaves. Avoid terminations if the employee is on or has recently returned to work from one of these following types of leaves. They went out on sick leave. They went out on Family Medical Leave Act or S California Family Rights Act. Those are two uh, protections for taking care of yourself or a family member who is sick or injured. Workers' compensation leave. When they go out on a workers' comp leave, they've got time off of work. I had one guy who was off for uh, over a year and the company wanted to terminate him so that they could replace his position. And we were told by the attorneys, just don't do it. You're just asking for trouble. So we didn't do it. Um, Americans with Disability Act leave. They, they, are, they have a known disability and they're out on leave and you try to terminate them when they first come back, bad idea, bad, bad idea. Parental leave, jury duty, military leave. And there are times when, when those things, those protected leaves, when you may have already, already been planning on terminating the person and then they went out on one of these types of leaves, there are ways to terminate based on the previous history your previous reason, but you want to work with a, either a, an HR consultant or an attorney if you try to do that. Recent complaints. If, <laughs> if your employee has made a recent complaint about sexual harassment or safety violations or unfair pay practices or anything else that they come up with that says you, the company, you, the business owner, are just doing this wrong and you... Um, terminate them after that, that can be seen as a retaliation and they have protected rights for retaliatory behavior from their companies. Number 13, consult with an HR consultant or attorney, as I just said, if you have any questions about the legality of terminating an employee. It doesn't matter if it's a layoff, it doesn't matter if it's a RIF. If you have any questions, go to the people who've been doing it for a long time or who, who are licensed. HR consultants are rarely both HR consultants and attorneys, but there are some out there. Um, but attorneys are licensed. They are allowed to give you legal advice. An HR consultant is not allowed to give you advice. What we're, well, we give advice, but we're not allowed to give you legal advice. In other words, I can give you examples of why you shouldn't do something but I can't say, well, from a legal standpoint, you're liable for this. I can say, if you go ahead and do this, this could potentially happen. If it's a big enough issue outside the scope of the consulting agreement, I always, always refer them out to attorneys. So we ask a lot of questions, we give you suggestions, and we tell you potential risks, but only an attorney can actually give you legal advice. Number 13.1, the reason this section has so few tasks uh, related to it compared with hiring is that it, in reality, the process is very much more about how and why and your ability to communicate effectively and know where the uh, pitfalls are and what your risks are. But the actual tasks in terminating are not nearly as many as in hiring. So final pay rules in California, if you fire someone on 
on the spot. You haven't given them any notice. Um, you have to have their paycheck ready that day. So know that their final paycheck through that day, you have to pay. If you give them notice, like you're gonna lay them off in the future, you can pay them on a regular pay cycle, or you can pay them through auto, their direct deposit. But you have to have that all in writing, and you have to check every six months, has the, have the final pay rules in California changed, because I'm telling you, every six months we have new laws. The notice to employee as to change in relationship, that is an actual form that needs to go to every employee that you terminate. It um, is part of the labor code, and it just is a checkbox. It's checking a box saying on what date and for what reason. Was it a layoff? Was it a discharge? Was it a reduction hours? Was it a furlough? Or write in something else. And um, employees, when they file claims for unemployment, they sometimes are required to use that document if you, the employer, have given the EDD a different answer about why they left than the answer you gave them, the employee. So sometimes employers, bad behavior, but sometimes employers will give a different answer just so the person doesn't get their unemployment. So you notify your benefits providers to, to terminate benefits. Most benefits are paid on a monthly basis by the company. And so they last for the whole month. If you terminate somebody on the second of the month, their benefits are gonna last through the end of the month, most of the time. Check with your benefits providers. Collect all of their equipment, files, cell phones, credit cards, uh, company car, anything that they have in their possession that belongs to the company. Deactivate all network access. If they have keys to the, to the building, if they have security cards, if they have anything where they could get into your systems, deactivate those uh, types of access before the termination meeting. Here's what happens. You don't do it before the termination meeting and you allow them to go back to their cash register or their desk or their machine. And sometimes they do things that sabotage your company or your equipment. It happens. Uh, try to make your termination meetings as congenial as possible so that you can do things like get their passwords to any subscriptions that belong to the company. And also if you have a good working relationship with the person if you made, made it very clear what the termination is about especially if it's a no fault like a layoff or a rift um, get them to write down all of their work in process so that you can give it to the manager so that that manager can reassign everything immediately and then always have a witness with you in a termination meeting some people think that this is silly but it's incredibly important the reason you have the witness there is so that they can attest to the fact that you said what you said in the meeting. I've had only a few employees over time ask for a witness in the meeting for themselves. And in those few occasions, I've said, of course. So um, that's it on that. I have a feeling you may have questions about the firing and layoff and unemployment and how unemployment maybe uh, how your unemployment rates may go up if you're considering laying off people right now. Um, so again, I'd like to open it up to questions if you have any. Thank you, Linda. Uh, while we're waiting for uh, anybody with questions, I do want to say that with the uh, slides, we're also going to be sending you uh, some information about uh, some of the uh, issues with the pandemic, uh, help for businesses and help for employees. And also, uh, it's just uh, released an FAQ about the CARES Act, which I understand the House uh, has approved and is heading towards the President's desk for signature. Um, and we'll have a, just a little bit of a summary sheet, and I'm going to share that with you as well, just so that you guys know what's coming down the pike. Uh, so yeah, any, any questions at all? No, thank you. Thank you, uh, Linda. Thank you very much, SPDC. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks okay, for being thank here, Holly. Thank you. Okay, well, 
All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, anything, I'm sorry, did I? Yeah, I, I, just, I, just, uh, I just sent a, a question on the chat. Um, uh, <laughs> I was um, wondering if the termination meeting has to be face-to-face -face or um, can, can it be done electronically? It can be done electronically. It's not advised for so many reasons. Um, it doesn't give the person the opportunity to ask questions. Um, I have a very strict policy about how to do terminations, about what can and can't be said, and I rarely let my managers uh, talk at all. <laughs> and there are lots of reasons for that. But if you know the, the, you know the do's and don'ts, it's best to have the person in the room unless you believe the person is volatile or violent. I, I've had things thrown at me. I've had my car scratched. Um, so yeah, there are times when you don't want to have the person in the room. Most of the time, I prefer to have them in the room. However, I've worked with a lot of remote employees and I've worked in you know, countries all over the world and, and uh, states all over this country. And um, I can't be in the same place. And so I've done them by phone. I've done them by video conference. It's rough, but it's possible. And there's nothing illegal about it. It's just a little bit less, uh, you know, it, it doesn't give the person the opportunity to speak their mind. And right. that, that goes a long way in terms of how they, you know, recover. Okay. And sometimes the damage that they do to your company, if they're really upset, they can do some awful things. So, you know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, very, Absolutely. yeah, very grateful for this uh, webinar. It's been very uh, informative and educational. Thank you. Okay. If anybody has questions in the future, feel free to contact me at my email or phone number right there. Yes. Or you can contact us at the SBDC and we'll, uh, we'll put you in touch with Linda. Or, and I very, very much appreciate you guys, uh, attending. I put a link in the uh, chat. If you'd be so kind as to uh, fill out an evaluation form for us, the SBA will love us if we give them <laughs> the evaluation forms. And we'll also send you the link by email. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Okay.